Professor Dave and Chegg here. When we perform chemical reactions, it is very unlikely that two substances will be present in precisely the right amounts in order to both react completely. Inevitably, one substance will run out first, leaving some of the other unable to react. The reactant that runs out first is called the limiting reactant, or limiting reagent, and the one that has some left over will be called the reagent in excess. Let's look at a simple analogy to see how this works. Say we are making cheese sandwiches for a family lunch, and we make them according to the following reaction, so to speak. One slice of cheese plus two slices of bread will make one cheese sandwich. So the stoichiometric coefficients of this reaction will be one to two to one. Let's say we look in the fridge and we see that we have 28 slices of bread and 11 slices of cheese. How many sandwiches can we make? 28 slices of bread could potentially make 14 sandwiches but 11 slices of cheese can only make 11 sandwiches. So in this case, cheese will be the limiting reagent. It will get used up completely in order to make the 11 sandwiches, and some bread will be left over, making it our reagent in excess. There will be six slices of bread left over. Make sure to note that the limiting reagent will not always be the one present in the smaller amount. If we instead had 15 slices of cheese along with the 28 slices of bread, then all of a sudden bread would become the limiting reagent since that can only produce 14 sandwiches, while 15 slices of cheese can produce 15 sandwiches. So even though there are more slices of bread than slices of cheese, the bread would run out first, leaving one slice of cheese left over. This should teach us that we must always consult the stoichiometric ratio of a reaction in order to figure out which substance is the limiting reagent. Let's apply this to some real chemistry. Silicon nitride, which is a solid, is produced according to this equation involving solid silicon and nitrogen gas. If we have 2 grams of silicon and 1.5 grams of nitrogen, which will be the limiting reagent? Well, the grams tell us nothing. We have to convert to moles. Let's use the molar masses of silicon and nitrogen to convert these into their respective molar quantities. So 2 grams of silicon divided by its molar mass gives us this many moles of silicon. Let's do the same with our mass of nitrogen and we end up with this many moles of nitrogen. Let's replace our gram values here with the molar quantities we just calculated. Now be sure to remember what we learned with the cheese sandwiches. The limiting reagent is not automatically the substance present in the lesser amount. An extremely common error would be to look at these values and say that nitrogen is the limiting reagent because there is less of it. But this may or may not be the case. We must do some stoichiometric calculations to find out. One strategy we could use would be to take the moles of one substance and see how many moles of the other are required for it to react completely. For example, this many moles of silicon times this stoichiometric ratio gives us the number of moles of nitrogen that would be required for all of the silicon to react. Then the question becomes, do we have that many moles of nitrogen available? We do indeed have more than that. This means that silicon would run out first and is therefore the limiting reagent. To be thorough, let's do the same for nitrogen. Again, we multiply by the stoichiometric ratio, being careful to put silicon on top and nitrogen on the bottom, and we get this many moles of silicon that would be required. As expected, we do not have enough, which means the silicon would run out before the nitrogen completely reacts, and again, we conclude that it is the limiting reagent, while nitrogen is the reagent in excess. Let's look at another strategy that could be used to reach the same conclusion, just to give you some options as to how you want to rationalize this. Let's instead see how many moles of product each of these reactants could potentially generate by using the stoichiometric ratios between each substance and the product. This many moles of silicon could potentially generate 0.0237 moles of product. This many moles of nitrogen could potentially generate 0.0268 moles of product. The silicon cannot produce as much, so it must necessarily run out first, which means that silicon must be the limiting reactant. Now that we understand how to determine the limiting reagent, let's mention a few more things. Let's use the calculation we just performed involving the moles of limiting reagent and the moles of product we can therefore expect. This is called the theoretical yield. This is the amount of product we can expect if the limiting reagent reacts completely, meaning that every single reactant particle is converted flawlessly into product.
In other words, this is the greatest amount of product that is physically possible for this reaction given the amounts of these reactants. We can convert this into a mass if need be, just use the molar mass of silicon nitride, and there we have it, 3.32 grams. However, in reality, we will never attain this theoretical yield. There will always be unreacted starting material, side products, or material lost due to mechanical imprecision, so we will always get some amount less than this. What we actually get is called the actual yield, and we can use the actual yield to calculate the percent yield, which is the percentage of the theoretical yield that the actual yield represents. To get this, we simply divide the actual yield by the theoretical yield and multiply by 100. Let's say that we perform this reaction and collect the product, which we weigh out as being 2.89 grams. What will be the percent yield? Well, let's just divide by 3.32 grams, the theoretical yield, and multiply by 100. This gives us an 87% yield. This is a value that tells us something about the efficiency of a reaction, which can be quite useful. And with that, we have extended our understanding of stoichiometry to include limiting reagents and percent yield. We have a more realistic understanding of chemical reactions, as we now know that some amount of one or more reactants will always remain in excess once the limiting reagent is used up, and we know how to identify this limiting reagent and perform any relevant calculations. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.